All right. Sage Weil is the creator of the Ceph project. He originally designed Ceph as part of his PhD research in storage systems at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Since graduating, he's continued to refine the system with the goal of providing stable, next generation distributed storage file system for Linux. Sage is co-founder of DreamHost, and as a teenager, he created and sold WebRing. Um, I, I, you know, I want to make some snarky remark about the fact that, that you know, you're not a luster guy, but welcome. <laughs> I never can figure out, uh, there we go. Nope, no, it's Command L. That's the one I'm looking for. Thanks. There you go. Thank you. Um, hi. I just wanted to spend a few minutes um, talking about Ceph to you guys today, um, give a little bit of an introduction to how it relates to HVC and I think the problems that you guys all face, and try to frame it in the context of how it is similar to Lustre, how it's different, and why you may or may not be interested. So, um, so I guess the, the question in your mind should be, what is Ceph? Um, at a high level, we describe Ceph as a distributed storage system. Um, I like to contrast it with the idea of a parallel file system. By distributed, um, we mean that it's a system that's built um, to be reliable, but it's built out of unreliable components. So it's designed from the ground up to be fault tolerant with no single points of failure. Um, part of that means um, building it out of commodity hardware. So think you know, regular rack mount servers from Dell or whoever else. Um, you can use expensive arrays, controllers, and specialized networks, but those things aren't required. Um, we'll try to make use of them, but um, they're not sort of an integral part of the architecture. Um, it's designed for very large scales, so anywhere from tens of servers to tens of thousands of nodes. Um, and at, at those large scales, systems by definition, or in most cases at least, need to be heterogeneous. Um, usually you buy, you know, your first petabyte of one type of hardware, six months later you buy another two or three petabytes, and so you want to be able to buy the latest iteration as you do that. So these um, clusters are sort of inherently dynamic, they're growing over time, um, mixed hardware, and so forth. So. Um, from the ground up, we designed stuff to be able to have incremental expansion or contraction as you sort of deprovision old breaking hardware uh, and so forth. Um, so that's sort of how, how Ceph is built, I suppose. Um, what Ceph provides is a unified storage platform. So from at the lowest layers, it provides uh, an object and compute storage platform um, based on distributed, replicated, highly available object-based storage. Um, and then on top of that sort of underlying infrastructure that Ceph provides, we, we provide a number of different services. So one of them is a RESTful object storage service um, based on the Amazon S3 and Swift APIs. Um, there's a block storage component that gives you sort of a, a reliable virtual disk similar to what you get out of a SAN. Um, that's integrated with the Linux kernel and with the KVM hypervisor, so people setting up private clouds use this frequently. Um, and then finally, sort of the most exciting piece is a distributed file system that's designed for you know, to give you POSIX semantics and be highly scalable for HPC workloads. That's actually where Ceph sort of originated, um, was um, some research money from the Department of Energy in the mid-2000s um, to look at, at that time, petabyte scale storage systems. Um, and then as the system grew and we sort of architected this, architected this entire thing and came to include, you know, object-based storage and, and block-based storage and so forth. Um, Ceph is open source, um, and it's based on the LGPL for the server side, the kernel side components um, for the block device and the file system are, of course, GPL because they're in the mainline Linux kernel where they've been for the last, last couple of years. So in a nutshell, that's sort of what Ceph is. It's a, it's a storage system that provides file access, block access, and object access. Um, this is an architecture picture that we use frequently. Um, sort of the, the key idea with Ceph is that the, the highly scalable, highly available piece is this Rados component at the bottom that gives you reliable and scalable object-based storage. Um, and then on top of that object substrate, we provide a number of different services, be they RESTful object storage, um, these virtual disks, um, or the Ceph distributed file system, which has its own metadata servers and so forth to, to build out that. But it's all based on Rados, this reliable object store. Um, but Ceph does a number of things differently. So looking specifically in the context of how people typically set up Lustre systems versus how Ceph systems are built. Um, in a sort of a conventional HA environment, you have some sort of access network. You typically have a redundant heads, OSSs, and sort of the Lustre case um, that are then talking to some back-end disk array that's designed to be highly reliable. So in, at a high level, you're striping across reliable things, reliable disk arrays. Um, Ceph is sort of entirely different from that. The, the assumption that we come from is that any component in the system can fail, and we don't want to have to sort of deal with the difficulties of configuring um, failover pairs and so forth. So the idea here is that we're striping over unreliable things, but those unreliable things are designed to be intelligent so that they're handling the um, consistency and coordination and replication of data across those different storage nodes. 
Um, in Ceph's case, there's um, usually a front-end network. There can also be a back-end network that handles where all the replication and data migration traffic goes, although that's sort of an optional, optional thing. But the, the key idea is that the servers are coordinating um, replication and recovery. Um, in a typical deployment, um, it'll look something like this. You'll have a node that has a whole bunch of disks. On top of each of those local disks, you'll have a local file system because we don't want to sort of reinvent the wheel with block allocation tables and so forth. So um, we like to use ButterFS, but um, People usually actually use XFS for stability reasons. You can also use X4. Um, ZFS in principle should work, although we haven't tested it recently. Um, but typically, you have a whole bunch of these things in a single rack mount server, you know, maybe 15 disks or something like that. Um, and then you have a whole bunch of these servers making up your storage cluster, um, tens, hundreds, thousands. Um, one of the key problems in these systems is how you distribute data. Um, so at the object layer, at, for Rados, one of the, basi the basic ideas is that you take all of your objects and you hash them and put them into sort of logical bu buckets that we call placement groups. And then each of these placement groups is replicated on multiple servers in the cluster um, using an algorithm called crush that makes sure that your replicas are separated across different racks and, and so forth. Um, and then when you do this with all of, when you distribute all of your different placement groups, you have sort of this randomized uniform distribution of data across all of your storage nodes. Um, the client then, when it needs to read or write data, um, is using essentially um, an algorithm to determine where to find the data and where to store it. So it does a calculation based on the object name and that tells it which server nodes to read and write data from. So instead of contacting a metadata server to find out where object foo is, it'll actually do some local calculation based on the state of the cluster and it'll know exactly which storage node to talk to. Um, one of the key advantages then is that you can share this sort of knowledge of where everything should be stored with the entire cluster. So that, for example, if you have a node that fails, um, say this grid out node, all of the other nodes in the cluster, when they discover that their peer has failed, they can calculate, they can look at their own placing groups, calculate whether they have, you know, a piece of data that is no longer fully replicated. And then in sort of a consistent parallel fashion, they can make sure that that placement group is replicated to another node in the cluster, redistribute the data using peer-to-peer -peer type protocols, all in a fully consistent way. So that later on when the client comes back and says, I need to read, you know, this object foo, it'll just recalculate the location of that data based on the new state of the cluster and it'll get the correct answer. Um, so this is sort of the key idea that makes the Ceph object storage layer scale to, you know, tens of thousands of nodes with very minimal central coordination. There isn't somebody that's saying, you read this data and move it over there. Instead, the central coordination is simply saying, this node is up and this node is down, and everybody's sort of responding by moving, moving the data around. Um, so Libratos is a, the low-level library that lets you sort of access this, this distributed storage layer. Um, that's, you know, it's a standard shared library of bindings in every language you can imagine. Um, but in contrast to many other systems, it gives you a, a very rich object API. So um, in most object systems, an object is just a bunch of bytes and maybe some extended attributes. In Ceph, you can store a lot more than that. So you can store um, keys and values inside an object in an efficient way. Um, think Berkeley DB tables or NoSQL tables, something like that, where each, each object is a log logical container of keys and values, but you can store lots of them and get efficient insertion solutions, range queries, stuff like that. Um, it supports um, atomic single object transactions, so you can do things like atomic compare and swap, you know, update the bytes and the keys and values in an atomic fashion, and it'll be consistently replicated and distributed across the cluster in a safe way. Um, there's all this infrastructure to support snapshots, and that's used by the, the block layer and the file system to give you, you know, per disk image and per directory snapshots in the system. And that's all supported at the object layer. Um, but one of the more exciting features is that Ceph allows you to embed code into the object storage daemon to actually implement um, your own functionality. So you can imagine if you were building, you know, the next Flickr or something, you might embed code in your object store um, that'll manipulate images to generate thumbnails and so forth. So you can send an object method call to the object store and it'll actually perform that computation with the data without having to read, the, read and write the data across the network. Um, and finally, there's some infrastructure for inter-client communication and coordination for locking and so forth. Um, so you can do a lot with this, this object store and, and we use a lot of these features when we're building these higher level services on top of that. Um, so one of the more contentions, contentious things um, I'd like to say is that as, as I think as a community, as we move toward Exascale, um, my assertion is that successful Exascale architectures um, are going to need to transcend or replace POSIX. Um, sort of the old paradigm of having you know, this weird file and directory structure um, with these very strange oddities around the semantics of POSIX are not really going to scale well when you start talking about you know, um, Exascale scales, simply because the hierarchical model does not distribute well. 
Um, but further, I think that su successful architectures um, are going to need to blend, blur the line that we currently have between compute and storage. So a lot of processes that we have are manipulating data locally and are operating specifically on a, on a small piece of data. And part of those distributed processes are taking data from multiple locations and comparing them and doing some sort of higher level calculation. And currently, all of our distributed architectures are sort of blurring the line between these two. They sort of assume that our storage is either always far away or it's always nearby and are sort of not sort of recognizing the distinction between these two processes. Um, and I think that a successful scalable architecture needs to sort of recognize that distinction so that you can, you can ship the operations that are operating purely on local data to the data and perform it there. And you can do the processes that need data from multiple locations and pull the data from both locations and do it locally. Um, and that's something that I think hasn't really been resolved in this area. Um, but finally, I think that fault tolerance and fault tolerance needs to be considered as the first class property of these architectures. Um, as we sort of push the scale of our existing architectures, when we start building things like burst buffers and so forth, so we can do these huge checkpoints across millions of cores, um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, um, in my humble opinion. So that being said, um, POSIX is going to be here for some time. It's not actually going anywhere. So. Um, we continue to build systems that will support POSIX so we can run all these legacy codes and so forth. So um, to that end, um, systems like Lustre and stuff will continue to build distributed file systems that can actually support those applications. Um, so CephFS builds a POSIX namespace on top of Rados. We have a separate cluster of metadata servers that are, handle the file system namespace in a distributed fashion. Um, we store all that metadata in objects so we can leverage the fact that we already have reliable, redundant um, data storage. Um, we provide strong consistency, a stable client protocol. Um, the Ceph file system was originally architected with HPC requirements in mind. That was actually sort of the genesis of the research for the project. Um, so we distribute the names, namespace across multiple servers. We mitigate bursty workloads and adapt the distribution as workloads shift over time. Um, so one of the, the high-level architecture looks very similar to what Lustre does. So the clients are talking to metadata servers to deal with the file system namespace. They're talking to the object storage nodes to actually read and write file data. Um, the difference is that you have lots and lots of metadata servers. So um, the, the challenge there is that you have sort of a single hierarchy of trees, and it's sort of non-trivial how you decide how to distribute those directories across multiple servers. And you can't simply hash them across um, many nodes and expect, expect to get good performance. So what Ceph does is it sort of dynamically monitors the, the temperature heat map of the file system hierarchy and it determines what appropriately sized portions of the file system tree are um, so that it can migrate them to different servers. Um, and it does this dynamically over time by periodically doing a load balance exchange and so forth. So as your workload shifts over time, as a new batch job starts up, it'll identify which parts of the tree are popular, take an appropriately sized piece and move it to a different metadata server by ship simply shipping the cache contents of one MDS over to another MDS and letting the clients continue in a totally transparent fashion. Um, it has another um, uh, of other sort of interesting features that you don't find present in most other file systems. Sort of because we built the file system namespace from the ground up, we can sort of build these into the infrastructure. So one of those features is recursive accounting. Um, the metadata servers keep track of recursive directory stats for every directory in the file system. So for example, when you do an ls-al, the file size that you see for a directory is actually the total number of bytes stored in that directory recursively in the system. So the same thing you get from a DU, but in real time, more or less. Um, CephFS also, also supports snapshots, um, sort of the motivation being that once you start talking about um, petabytes and exabytes of data, it doesn't really make sense to have a single snapshot data retention policy for the entire system. You need to be able to snapshot different directories and different data sets. Um, so in Ceph, you can actually create a snapshot in any directory in the system, and it'll affect just that subtree of the system. And you can create the snapshots and remove them using sort of standard bash, bash type commands. Um, so all of that being said, it's possible to run an experiment with Ceph um, in Lustre environments um, using sort of typical Lustre hardware, um, but it's not, it's not really ideal. And I don't know what is going on. I don't know if I touched something or what. Oh, there it goes. I won't touch it. <laughs> all right. So the real, the real difference is that for, for Lester, um, it has been tuned um, heavily and successfully over the last decade to run on high-end disk arrays and high-performance networks. Um, Ceph has not sort of had the luxury of that, of that tuning. It's really designed to run on smaller nodes with directly attached disks um, that are less reliable. Um, so it's possible to run Ceph on Lester-style hardware if you have that stuff just laying around and want to experiment with it. Um, 
But what we find usually is that the redundancy from the expense of arrays isn't strictly necessary because Ceph can replicate across servers. Um, so typically in a Ceph environment, you would actually buy more nodes with more disks and you replicate across those, but it'd be overall much less expensive because they're you know, commodity pieces instead of stuff that you get from, from the high-end array vendors. Um, Ceph can also utilize the Flash NVRM directly, um, whereas usually those components are sort of buried deep within the disk array where you can't sort of access it normally. Um, so we did some tuning um, as an experiment on some hardware that was at um, Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, basically, we took some existing OSTs, um, OSSs, I guess, um, backed by a DDN disk array. I actually have no idea what kind, except that it was roughly 12 gigs a second was sort of the max that we were supposed to be able to get from it. When we initially were turned over access of the cluster and initially just ran our sort of naive installation, we got 100 megs per second out of it. Um, by the end of our experiment, we were getting 5.5 gigs per second, which was actually 11 because of the way that Ceph was journaling. So we're roughly saturating the disk array, which was kind of nice. Um, but there are a couple sort of caveats. Um, one is that the way that Ceph is writing data to the disks, it's actually doing double writes because it has a write-ahead journal and then actually it writes the data to the file system. Um, that's designed to use, um, to be used with conjunction with um, Flash or NVRAM the same way that a, a NetApp disk array would do that. Um, and that's usually buried in the disk array, so we're actually writing twice to the array. The other thing is that we're using IP over InfiniBand because we don't have native <coughs> IP support and stuff yet. Um, but it was sort of a, a long series of annoying things that we had to change. You know, there was the configuring the InfiniBand network properly, you know, reconfiguring the ones on the DDN, um, choosing which type of disk the journals and the data went to, um, reconfiguring the ones again, tuning the OSD ratios, fixing TCP auto tuning and read ahead and all sorts of all sorts of annoying things that Mark Nelson can tell you. Um, about in much more detail. Um, so the good news is that once we actually like work through all these annoying issues, we actually could get respectable performance. Um, the bad news is that you can't simply just plug it in and expect to get good numbers. But I guess you you probably are used to that same that same issue with with other um, with Lustre as well. Um, so that's that's mostly what I wanted to talk about. Um, a little bit more information if you're interested in trying stuff or think it might be suitable for your, your use cases or workloads, whether it's HPC or distributed computation or whatever. Um, Ceph.com has all sorts of resources about how you can get involved in the community, um, test it out, and so forth. So, any questions? Yes. Well, in your uh, native environment, how do you handle the redundancy? Do you have erasure code running in some node, or you don't have that? You just copy to several disks. Ceph is doing pure replication across nodes. So typically, a node is just a raw disk, um, and it's considered to be unreliable. And when you write to the, the disk, it actually replicates that write to other one or more other nodes. So you can do one X replication, you can do three X replication, whatever you whatever you choose. So the redundancy is through replication. Yes, oh, through replication, thanks. right? So you can run RAID underneath an individual Ceph OSD, and it'll just be, as a whole, more reliable. But in theory, your, your entire OSD could still explode. So, yeah. Sage? Yes. Sage, how did you do the Lustre test? I didn't follow that, the, the mapping oh. of the test at Oak Ridge. Oh, it wasn't actually a Lustre test. It was testing Ceph on hardware that was what you would typically use to run Lustre. So it was uh, an OSS server that was bought to run Lustre, so it's a typical Lustre OSS, and a DDN array that was usually used to back, back Lustre. So this is the, the type of hardware that you'd buy for a Lustre configuration, would be a, an expensive, big, fast, awesome disk array, and then a bunch of head nodes, um, which isn't the usual Ceph configuration. So we had to you know, make Ceph perform in that environment. So, so here's another idea. Um, we've just, you heard, might have heard the talks today about the OSD abstraction of Lustre servers away from the backend store. Mm -hmm. What about using Ceph as the backend store, using a Ceph OSD to get access to your object store across these redundant servers. Um, that would be a way of getting POSIX without having to do the Ceph FS. Yeah, I, I, I got here a little bit late, so I missed, I missed that talk, so I'd have to probably dig in in a bit more detail. We can talk about that after. Yep. Yeah. Sage, John. you mentioned that uh, you think POSIX will be missing from the Exascale storage stack, and I talked to you in the hall before, and I thought you were also going to talk about what you thought the exascale storage stack might look like in regards to burst buffers. Yeah, so I am I think that an exascale architecture shouldn't be based on POSIX. I think if you were to take a clean slate and say, how would we actually build a machine that's big and efficient, um, 
it wouldn't look anything like what we have today. Um, so that's sort of my contention. So all that being said, I think the systems that we actually build because we're migrating all these legacy codes and that are you know poorly written and so forth, then there'll actually be POSIX in there. Um, taking a bit, a bit more specifically, when you start talking about things like burst buffers, um, it seems to me like the, the reliability model is that we have this huge computation with a bazillion nodes that are all sort of not built with fault tolerance in mind. Um, that are highly interdependent, and the only way that we can think to make that reliable is to take a, a system-wide checkpoint, um, and since the, the math just doesn't work, there's no way we can actually dump that much of data to disk in any reasonable amount of time. We have to build in flash into every node and all this and so forth, and so that's, that's sort of how we ended up at this point. But I wouldn't... I'm sorry? How Ceph would be jitter-free? Yeah, I'm not saying that, that Ceph is any different with the burst buffer and, and so forth. I think, I think that um, a, more, um, a more interesting exascale architecture would be one that um, is based on um, objects that you're storing, it's computation that is run directly on the objects, and computation that, that is sort of aggregating the results from different objects. And it would be some sort of, you know, more cloudy infrastructure that is actually running those computation on those nodes and then aggregating the results and then writing it to new objects and so forth. So it would be this huge dependency graph and data flow diagram and not sort of this lockstep computation that's being checkpointed. Yeah. Implementation, is it uh, user space or did you move it to kernel? Uh, it's both. So all the server side and stuff is um, in user space. They're all just user level daemons. Um, the client side is either user level clients, um, shared libraries and so forth, or um, the Linux kernel has a client for the block device and for the file system. So you can map dev rbd0, that's a, that's a raw block device that's striped over Ceph objects. It's like a like what you get out of iSCSI or something like that. Or the CephFS will actually mount the POSIX namespace. That way. Oh, yeah. quick, question. quick question, and I'm the next speaker, so I'm just preventing oh, yeah. myself from getting okay. out there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The test you did on the, the Lustre hardware and the DDN hardware, what was uh -huh. the, and maybe if you, you mentioned this, I missed it, what was the driver? What were you using, the file system or the block device or um, object storage? What were we using? Actually, I actually don't remember. I think we were actually using just writing to their object store at that point. We were just getting the, the object layer to perform. Just, just liberate us? Yeah, yeah. Thank okay. you, Sage Weil. Thank you. Rock on. <laughs>